Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information, it is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And this is... Eh, 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 eh. That's Cam the Provocateur in Dolphin. Uh, well, uh, that was an intro. Thank you, Cam. Um, and joining us from his orbiting spaceship, it is none other than... Matthew Bradford. Matthew, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, um, before we talk about necessarily the film we're doing this week, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, we put out a, a blast on Shane Whaley's Spybrary Facebook group a little while ago in regards to this film series, and that's, I think, how we got talking originally. Is that right? Yeah, although uh, I didn't actually uh, respond. I think someone volunteered me. Um, <laughs> you're like, how did I get here? And why am I talking to these people? <laughs> um, actually, had we been trying to talk about another movie earlier or so? Cause I was certainly aware of you guys, uh, for, well, I guess through, through Spyberry, but, um, I am a fan of the show and I'm, I'm happy to be on it, but, uh, yeah, I think maybe someone had referred me because of work that I'd done on these movies before. Okay. Um, well, let's just sort of talk about you a little bit. So, you have a connection to the films, which we'll get into, but, uh, and for those who haven't listened to Spyberry podcast, you'll, you'll see Matthew pop up from time to time, but just tell us a little bit about your history with spy films. Uh, I mean, like most people, I got into them through the bond movies, you know, that was my, my first love. And it was at a certain point that you can, all, I mean, no, I was going to say you can only watch a bond movie so many times, but we all know that's not true. You can mm. <laughs> watch them uh, forever, but I wanted something more, you know, I was trying to, so, so I just finally kind of poked my head out of the bond realm into other areas. And Flint was one of the earlier ones that I tried. Cause it was something I was aware of, you know, this was back in the video days uh, when I was a kid. And then um, the uh, Ipcris file was another one that I saw early on. And then more when I was an adult, I got more into the Euro spy movies and uh, which are the European kind of bond knockoffs of the sixties, which are just, great you know bond on a teeny budget but still with immense creativity and that was mainly because i wanted posters on my wall that were bond like but couldn't afford original bond posters but your spy movies you know the budget doesn't limit the poster art you know and they have these great spy posters so that's how i got into euro spy movies and at a certain point i started a blog called double o section that covers spies in all media you know books comics movies tv and that was in 2006 because basically there wasn't something like that. I just wanted, uh, you know, I was looking for it, couldn't find it. So I uh, started doing it and got really deep into that. Unfortunately, these days I don't update it nearly often enough, but uh, I keep hoping to uh, get more active about that again. And you can find me often on the Spyberry podcast now, though, or on a subset of it called TV uh, Spy TV Rewind with Jeff Quest and various other podcasting places. So, Matthew, you're telling me as a, a kid you watched Ipcris File and then continued to watch spy movies after that. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, but you know, uh, I was not a fan of that as a kid. Um, and, uh, you know, we do things too young at some point. I, I tried reading The Spy Who Came In from the Cold too early, too. That was in middle school when I was in the midst of. Fleming and and Robert Ludlum and the spy who came in from the cold is not you know I was expecting cold I thought it would be ski chases and stuff you know and mm. <laughs> instead there's a whole chapter where the uh the main character is sick and drinks um Bovril. you know it's like not what I was expecting um of course I came back to it as an adult and I absolutely love that book and love Le Carre but the other problem with the Ipcris file is that it was a VHS that I got from a rental store and it was pan and scan and that to me is one of the most beautiful widescreen movies ever composed. Like the compositions in that movie are just amazing and they get ruined by a pan and scan. So yeah, that, you know, it was cool that there was more spy stuff out there. And I certainly loved the John Barry music at that point, And Michael Caine was cool, but that didn't make me a Harry Palmer fan at that time. That was something kind of that I came back to later on. Well, I'm curious, you cited the European spy films and I think a lot of people listening to the podcast or interested in spies in general, don't they know their favorite James Bonds or, you know, some of the other franchises. But what are some European spy films that maybe people should check out? 
Oh, well, my absolute favorite, and, and a lot of British films do get lumped in with this. Uh, you know, some people might split hairs and say it has to be Italian or French, but uh, Deadlier Than the Male, also a 1967 movie, is to me the best of the Euro spy movies and the best of the Bond knockoffs from the 60s. It's got this killer soundtrack, a great theme song by Scott Walker, uh, Elkie Summer, the best Bond girl who never was, <laughs> um, and... Uh, it's just, yeah, that one's a fantastic one. So definitely that. And uh, if you ever talk about that one, which hopefully you will, that's one I'd love to come back for. Um, but uh, the OSS 117 movies from France right. are mm-hmm. terrific. Uh, more recently, they've done comedy versions of that in, in the last decade or so, which are also excellent. But the originals in the 60s were serious. And they were they kind of had the closest budget to Bond, which is still nowhere near Thunderball or so, because Bond movies were, you know, had more money than anybody. <laughs> but um, the, yeah, the OSS 117s have still pretty substantial budgets and they do a lot of things before Bond. You know, my favorite one is uh, called, um, well, it has a lot of different titles, but um, it takes place in Tokyo and it was made before You Only Live Twice and it has a, uh, a ship with a bow that opens up to swallow smaller ships. It has a, um, it, it has uh, a fight with someone getting thrown through a sort of rice paper wall, which of course you're going to have, you know, uh, but it does a lot of things that you only live twice would do. And actually Terrence Young, who directed, you know, three of the first four Connery bonds has a credit on that movie as well. Uh, Terror in Tokyo is what we'll call it. Uh, that's its English title, but um and they do them well, you know, um, and uh, Frederick Stafford stars in that one. Kerwin Matthews had starred in the earlier ones. Um, so I, yeah, I highly recommend the OSS 117 movies. It's funny. It's kind of like, you know, we're going to talk uh, about In Like Flint this week, but um, our man Flint um, had the whole volcano lair which was also before You Only Live Twice. So it seems like a lot of things that You Only Live Twice is credited with were, um, you know, happening well before that movie. Yeah, and uh, I think Carry On Spying had a volcano base, and definitely The Road to Hong Kong did, complete with a monorail, and that was like 62 or 63, you know, very early on. I keep pushing for Carry On Spying, but Cam doesn't seem to want to talk about the Carry On films. I never said that. (laughs) You're going to have to at some point, Cam. <laughs> yep, yep. We'll do Carry On Spying for sure at some point. It's on the list, damn it. <laughs> we, we, we recently did uh, One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing, which uh, kind of is in the same tone as the Carry On Spy film. Oh, wow. Uh, That's an interesting one to include. I like that. There's also a Euro spy called One of Our Spies is Missing, that, or One of Our Russian Spies is Missing that sort of spun off from... Sorry, no, that's a Man from Uncle movie. The Euro Spy movie is called Somebody Stolen Our Russian Spy, but I always think of them coming out of that title. <laughs> right. Well, you may have just given us some new films to put to, on our list For by sure. the sounds of it. Uh, I hope so. we, we've, got the, we've got the OSS ones. We, we've spoken about the the comedy remakes, but I'm, I am looking forward to doing the originals, actually. There is now a beautiful Blu ray set. You know, when I was getting into those Euro Spy ones, I was like, basically trading physical uh, bootlegs with people around the world, you know, burning things. And of course now you can find all that on torrents or, you know, things that obviously we don't know anything about, but um, there's uh, a lot of them are actually legitimately available now, which, you know, it's an obscure genre. So that's amazing. And Kino Lorber put out in America um, a great set of uh, OSS 117 movies on Blu-ray. The only problem is it doesn't include the dub, the English dub audio tracks, which, I actually prefer on those because it is the actors themselves are American actors and they're speaking in their own voices. Um, oh. But it just includes the French. So the French that you're getting is actually a dub track, but it includes English subtitles for it. Oh, so the original ones were in English. The uh, lead actors were speaking English. I think a, a lot of the supporting oh. actors were French and were probably speaking French on set. Um, I'm not positive about France, but that's definitely how Italy did it. And there, most Euro spy movies are Italian, and basically everyone would be speaking their own language, so that there's no pure audio. You know, it's all dubbed in some way. Hmm. Okay. Well, Cam has kind of spoiled the film this week already. <laughs> so I'll, I'll 
I, I guess we'll pivot into how you're connected to the the Flint films because we obviously already covered our man Flint with Alan Porter. Uh, so you've you're in this week for in like Flint. What's your connection to the Derek Flint universe? Well, because of my blog of of Double O section, uh, I had been contacted years ago by John Cork, who produced the or co-produced the special features on the Bond special edition Blu-rays which are amazing documentaries They're originally on the DVDs and now carried over to the Blu-rays uh, like the inside Dr. No, you know, all those documentaries. Um, and he was producing special features for Fox for the Flint Blu-rays. Um, that Blu-ray ended up coming out as a, like a limited edition through twilight time and is unfortunately sold out. I, I would hope that someone would re-release it and include these special features one day. But so he invited me to basically be a talking head in these documentaries and, go on camera talking about Flint um, just because I cover a lot of the non-Bond spies, you know, the uh, the spies from the spy boom of the 60s that sort of followed in Bond's wake. And it was fun to discuss Flint on there. Um, I do think it it's given an impression online that the Flint movies are somehow favorites of mine, which they're actually not totally, you know, there's a lot to like that we'll talk about, but I, I wouldn't rank them <laughs> among my very favorites. Uh, but I did certainly do a lot of research on them for that project. So uh, I have a connection to them. Yes. We'd like to have people on that don't necessarily love the films automatically anyway. <laughs> so you're, you're just more of an expert in general, which I actually prefer. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, Cam, I think we've already spoiled it, but what are we talking about this week? We are tackling 1967's In Like Flint, the second and final James Coburn Flint film. Okay, well let's let's talk about this uh, this letterbox dot com synopsis real quick. Okay, uh, because it's a it's a <laughs> that's ominous. It, it's a yeah. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of punctuation, uh, and yeah, it's going to be an interesting ride. So uh, strap yourselves in, folks. In like Flint, Flint's back in action, in danger, in the Virgin Islands, where the bad guys. Are girls okay? Flint, no, no, no. Oh, there's a big pause. It's built a pause into it. It's so strange. Okay. Um, next part. Flint is back again, called out of retirement when his old boss finds that he seems to have missed three minutes while golfing with the president. Flint finds that the president has been replaced by an actor. Flint's line with a wistful look. An actor. As a president, Flint finds that a group of women have banded together to take over the world through subliminal brainwashing in beauty salons that they own. Okay, well, there's a lot of things being found there, and coherence is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's parentheses. There's all kinds of things going on here. It's a, it's a bit of a, oh, it's a, a horribly put together. And, and, unless Matthew wrote it, in which case it was amazing. <laughs> yes, no. yes, yes. Although I can tell you the beginning does come from the poster. You know, those were the in, those in repeated things are right from the uh, ad campaign for the movie. That's kind of fun. That first bit's fine. It's that second part, which I might even like copy onto like Twitter at some point just to get people to ridicule it some more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that sets it up terribly. I wouldn't want to watch the film after reading that. Mm-hmm. no 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 and it really only talks about i mean it, do, it in all that verbiage it doesn't really describe the plot of the movie does it no no um well i i haven't really seen these films before covering for the podcast so i don't have any prior connection uh, matthew obviously you were on the blu-rays but apart from that had you spent much time with the flint films in the past yeah, um, they were ones that I kind of branched out to early on from James Bond because they're two of the more available ones. They were on, they had uh, VHS releases, they had um, DVD releases early on that kind of tied in with the Austin, the third Austin Powers movie being released because um, they were clear influences on those films. But yeah, the first time I discovered it was before Austin Powers. It was when I was a kid. And the first one I saw was in like Flint, not Our Man Flint. Um, so in some ways, it's very appropriate that I'm on this for this one. Uh, 
And early on, I mean, I'm going to jump into something that I assume would come up anyway, but early in the movie, Flint talks to dolphins as, as Cam did in the introduction. And that was almost too much for me. I was like expecting a sort of Bondian spy, but more comedy, but I was not expecting talking to dolphins. You know, that as a kid, that was too far out for me from what I was uh, in uh, expecting. And it just sort of set up from the beginning that in like Flint was going to have a hard time winning me over. <laughs> um, it, it, then later on when the DVDs came out, you know, I, I certainly appreciated them more when I was in college, but um, yeah, as a kid, I wasn't ultimately that into and like Flint. And I probably would have been a lot more into our man Flint if I had started with that one, which I think is a more accessible movie to any age. I have to say as, as a kid, I think I would rather have watched this than the Ipquist file. <laughs> okay, I, I'll agree with you there. That what, you know, I don't know that ten-year-old Cam is going to enjoy the Ipcris file that much. Uh, well, what about you, Cam? Any other connection? Um, no. Um, I had not seen this one. I'd seen Our Man Flint before we did that film, but um, I actually bought the two of these movies at a um, thrift store oh a couple years ago. And once we started this podcast, I held off watching my copy of In Like Flint until we actually covered it. So. This is the first time through. Do you have the uh, the Blu-rays? I don't. They're the DVDs, and uh, the cover of In Like Flint has a um, you know a tagline on it saying, "My favorite movie, Austin Powers." <laughs> yeah, so those are the ah. ones that came out when the third Austin Powers movie came out, which was a great time because Fox released. I mean, Austin Powers aren't Fox movies, but to cash in on that, they released four movies, which was. The two Flint movies and Fathom with Raquel Welch and Modesty Blaze. And, you know, these are better known among the the sort of deep cuts, but they're still deep cut spy titles. So it was amazing that because of this comedy phenomenon shining a light on 60s spy movies, we were getting those releases so early on in the DVD format. Um, that was really cool. But there was after that actually a better special edition DVD set, which is while the Blu-rays are way too expensive, that DVD set is only like a dollar 97 on Amazon or something. So if you love the Flint movies, you may want to upgrade your uh, Austin Powers testimonial copy for um, the, the Flint <laughs> collect, the ultimate Flint collection, which included <laughs> some bonus material, although not the ones that I'm on. <laughs> Uh, there's none on my versions, so anything is better than nothing. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so we had Al Man Flint, which made the knock list, and I think is it a year later this film comes out? Yeah, yeah, one year later. So how, I, and usually I would just ask Cam this question, but I think between Cam and Matthew, we can piece together the story of what went from Our Man to In Like. Yeah, um, so basically this was written back-to-back by Hal Fimberg, who'd written Our Man Flint. And um, they brought on a different director this time. Um, Daniel Mann wasn't coming back. So they brought on Gordon Douglas. Uh, Gordon Douglas was a veteran director. This guy had been around forever. He was a gag writer back in the day for like vaudeville. He had um, directed Our Gang shorts. Uh, And then he went on to do a lot of um, B-movies that some of them I really enjoyed, like Dick Tracy versus Cue Ball is really fun. The killer ant film Them from the 50s is really good. And he also directed Call Me Buana, the spy comedy made by Eon shortly after the launch of the Sean Connery films. It's the poster that is referenced in From Russia With Love. So, Oh yeah, the one Yeah. The so Gordon Douglas mm. had some credentials. But how much he actually directed this film is a little up in the air. Now, Matthew, are you familiar with this sort of insight? Yeah, well, I know that Coburn made claims that he, I guess, Gordon Douglas was ill while filming and he would leave set. And and Coburn did take credit for for part of the direction, along with, I think, his stuntman and uh, some other people. Um, I always take that with a bit of a grain of salt when an actor claims to have partly directed something. Um, I love James Coburn, but... Uh, he may have exaggerated, you know, his involvement to that extent. So I'm, I'm honestly not sure uh, what to believe there. Um, I mean, it feels like a Gordon Douglas movie to me. You know, it feels of a piece with things like um, uh, Lady in Cement and um, 
uh, Tony Rome, those Frank Sinatra detective movies he did around the same time. Um, it's similarly paced to other uh, of his movies of that era. So, you know, I'm sure he had at least had a hand in the pie. Yeah. Um, so I've got a quote from James Coburn here. Uh, the other person he that James Coburn referenced was the DP, William H. Daniels, who he said helped co-direct the film along with Bo, uh, Buzz Henry and himself. Um, but he had a quote where he said, Gordon Douglas was ill or had a heart problem or some damn thing. Anyway, he would come on the set and say what we were doing was wonderful and so on. Then he would often leave the set. Still, it was fun. So I, 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 part of me just wonders, like, maybe he was ill, but this guy had a certain vision and was able to kind of achieve it, even if he was just kind of watching other people oversee the production a little bit. I, I really like kind of like a creative producer almost role. I'm not really sure. It's a little strange and... I'm sure somewhat muddy over the many decades since this movie was made. Yeah. And I think it's important when talking about the Flint movies, speaking of creative producer, I mean, the main guy, as you guys talked about on the last one was, was Saul David. Like he was the primary um, mover and shaker behind the two Flint movies. Yeah, for sure. So Coburn said this movie had like a good budget. Um, I believe it was 3.8 million, but they had to shoot pretty fast. He just said that, like, there was a lot of writing problems on this one, that he said the script was never finished, they had to start shooting without an ending, and they were working on a different ending for the film, but the studio studio needed the movie done, so they tagged on a different one that was originally intended. Um, I'm just curious, Matthew, if you were at all familiar with maybe what the original ending might have been? Well, yes, they actually did shoot a different, a slightly different ending, not drastically different, that the... Um that the studio executives made them change, but I'm not sure if that's what, uh, what Coburn's referring to in that quote or not, because it's really just a slight, uh, it, it's basically a line that, uh, um, we'll cover, I guess, when we get to the end, but, um, I don't know about the whole other end. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all to, if, if what he said was true, but I didn't come across that in my own research. I've never seen a script, that has a, a fully different ending for it. But then again, he says they were still working on the script, so it may never have even gotten to a fully scripted stage. And you've looked at scripts for this film, right? I have, yeah. And how many like different drafts have you seen? You know, unfortunately, when I was doing that, Blu-ray project was a decade ago, um, so I can't give you the most precise answer. Uh, but... I saw a few that weren't radically different from each other. Uh, it was more jokes being changed than, um, you know, whole sequences. Right. Than an overall plot stuff. Yeah. Which could have been more sort of loose and fast on, on, on the set mm -hmm. changing jokes. Yeah. Um, well, I, you didn't mention camp. I, has the budget for this one gone up from the first one? Yeah. A little bit. Okay. I mean, the first one was a sizable hit for Fox, which is why they were so quick to greenlight a sequel. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one year later, that's very quick. <laughs> and I think they saw that, obviously, the spy craze at this point is huge. This is, you know, Our Man Flint comes out one year after Thunderball, which was a massive phenomenon. So if you are going to get into the spy craze, now is the time. See, I, I mean, I won't get into my thoughts of the film too much, but it seems like the perfect moment to mention it. I don't feel like the budget was bigger for this film. Really? It almost feels like a smaller film. <sighs> Well, I guess we'll get into that maybe when we talk about sequences, but I felt like there was a little more ambition to the um to some of the um like locations of the film. I mean, a lot of this is stage-bound stuff, but it felt a little bigger, a little more diverse. Yeah. I I think that a lot of it was ironically, I I see exactly how that would make you think that it's smaller because it was they were able to sort of create bigger sets and stuff in terms of things like that gymnasium. But the weird thing is in the first movie, I feel like the sets were more creative, like done on a smaller budget. So, so ultimately, or that space center set at the end of this, that's a huge set, but it's not that impressive if you've seen other spy movies, you know? So it does feel somewhat smaller, but also like Cam said, they did go on location to Jamaica for this one. I think they did three weeks of shooting there. Um, and I suspect a lot of the budget went into that. And that was probably more like, you know, Fox execs and producers wanted to bring their families to Jamaica. So, you know, let's do this. 
I did a little bit of research myself and I watched an interview with James Coburn. I think it was on the set yeah. in Jamaica. Um, and I just remember the line that made me laugh was, he says, oh, it, I just did this film as a part of a deal with Fox. It's okay. <laughs> it's money. And I was like, oh, all right then. He's, he's not that into it. Fine. Yeah, and he said the studio was really not behind the whole concept of women taking over the world, which he, Coburn was kind of a big fan of that concept. So I think he got a little disillusioned over the, uh, you know, the course of production on this one. Yeah, I mean, are we? Do we want to go into the that whole plot now? Because there are some some interesting uh, studio versus creative conflicts yeah. on that. Why don't we ho- put a button on that one? We'll come to that in just a couple minutes. But um, that kind of mostly sums up the behind the scenes on this film. I'll just mention the box office. Uh, the budget was, as I said, three point eight million. Uh, it grossed eleven million, so it was definitely a hit. Um, the top three for 1967 number one was the graduate number two was the jungle book and number three was bonnie and clyde several other spy movies this year so outperforming in like flint where you only live twice and the spoof movie casino royale but in like flint um outperformed the ambushers which is one of the dean martin matt helm films the president's analyst another james coburn film that we will be covering at some point in the future as well billion dollar brain the harry palmer film And The Naked Runner starring Frank Sinatra. So the film was definitely a success. Um, Now, why was there no sequel? Um, Coburn said he was open to it if they hired top directors and had strong scripts. That never happened. Um, Coburn said the studio didn't care about quality. But also it should be noted around this time, Coburn had started his own production company. And if you look at the man's career, it's very diverse. I feel like he probably wanted to... um, branch out a little bit than just doing spy films although he did do as i said the president's analyst the same year but i just feel like his interest wasn't necessarily there in kind of being like the um sean connery figure you know doing seven of these movies and the studio didn't seem committed to making them you know a pictures versus b pictures yeah and i think that the president's analyst is probably why you saw that reaction from coburn uh in that behind the scenes interview um scott because the president's analyst was a passion project for him so i think that's the difference you know he was certainly grateful for the success that the flint movies brought him because like you guys talked about last time that first our man flint propelled him from being you know a solid supporting actor to a movie star um so i I think he was he liked the character and was grateful for that, but he really, yeah, wanted to produce his own stuff. And the president's analyst was the first one. And you can tell, I mean, that movie to me is light years better than the Flint movies. Like that is in my top 10 spy movies for sure. And it's just, uh, it's such a a good uh, satire. Uh, It's so much sharper basically than the level of comedy that you get in, in like Flint. Um, and James Coburn definitely seems more invested in that one, which of course he's a producer on. So I think he he shot that right after uh, this movie. Um, and he's probably already thinking about that when he was doing that uh, publicity piece he saw. Now, I have a question for you, Matthew, because while we never saw a theatrical Derek Flint film again after In Like Flint, there was a 1976 TV movie called Dead on Target starring Ray Danton as a private investigator Derek Flint and there are very few people I think out there who I can ask if they've seen this but Matthew I'm gonna roll the dice have you seen this by any chance oh I certainly have (laughs) okay and how is it (laughs) it's terrible um it it like so many uh when the spy craze died which it did like right after the 60s it, it was kind of Watergate I think that killed it and also the uh here the senate hearings on cia covert activities in the 70s suddenly spies weren't heroes to people anymore and all the shows that were on tv went off only mission impossible continued to air into the 70s really and um all the the movies just stopped and then in the 70s you got you know the paranoid thrillers like three days of the condor and uh, um all the president's men that kind of thing but um dead on target was 
didn't have a spy in it. You know, it's like in this new era, we want, we don't want spy heroes. So a lot of the sixties spies were reinvented as seventies TV detectives like Matt Helm. There was a TV show, Matt Helm that made him a regular private eye. And for Flint, they made him like a regular private eye, which just isn't cases on this kind of world level. Both Flint movies established that he doesn't even want to clock in for something that's less than a threat to the world itself. And then on TV, he's just a regular detective. And I, you know, honestly, there's only one thing that makes the character of Derek Flint work and that's James Coburn. And I don't think anyone could have done it. So I I feel sorry for Ray Danton. I actually, I'm going to take this opportunity to correct myself because on those Blu-ray features, I've always felt bad that I was really kind of dragging on Ray Danton and mispronouncing his name at the same time saying Ray Danton. So I feel bad that I did that while, you know, basically uh, talking ill of him. (laughs) Um, he is good in his Euro spy movies in the sixties. He did uh, secret agent, super dragon, a very low budget Euro spy movie that is probably best known for its mystery science theater version, but, uh, and for being maybe the only spy movie with a scene set in the glamorous location of a bowling alley in Wisconsin. Um, but he was good in it though. And, um, and uh, lucky the inscrutable, you know, he, he made a good, spy hero then and he was good when guest roles on the man from uncle and stuff but as a leading man in the 70s uh he had aged a lot in that decade (laughs) um he's very sweaty throughout uh, dead on target (laughs) which is is kind of against the the coburn utterly cool persona you know like coburn's flint would never break a sweat i feel um And he has this sort of unruly mop of hair that just feels 70s, but not Flint. So now I'm getting again into these personal attacks on this actor who I do (laughs) admire, but was not Flint. You know, only only Coburn could really pull that off, I think. And the TV movie is uh, a nice curiosity. I'm glad it's included in the ultimate Flint collection, the DVD set. It's not on the Blu-rays. So for completists, you know, I will never sell those DVDs, even though I've got the Blu-rays, because I still want to own Our Man Flint Dead on Target. That said, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I very much appreciate having you actually give a review of that film on uh, this podcast, because I don't know that Scott and I will tackle that one. <laughs> yeah, there, I can tell you there's there's no need to dig that deep. And I think you... You have an out since it's a TV movie. <laughs> um, exactly. But it wasn't the first attempt to revive Flint. There was a script by Harlan Ellison, you know, one of the great uh, TV writers um, who I know you guys are Star Trek fans. Uh-huh. So obviously I'm sure you're City on the Edge of Forever fans. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Harlan Ellison wrote a, a third Flint movie called Flintlock. And it's published in a book of Harlan Ellison's scripts. Like you can get this. Um and I'm, I really don't know very much about this story behind it. Like it's not, um, I, c- I couldn't find that much about it when I was researching Flint movies. I know that Fox did talk about doing a third Flint movie. Um, the, in, and it was even mentioned in variety that that was going to happen at one point, but um, I, I think the reasons it didn't were a combination of, of sort of diminishing interest in the spy craze and saw David leaving Fox in, in a real fireball, which we'll get to when we talk about the ending of this movie, because that kind of led to that. But um, uh, I'm assuming that the Harlan Ellison script was for a TV movie as well. That's my guess. Um, I don't know why it ultimately wasn't used. I don't know if it was ever cast, um, but I'd be curious to know more about that. But I do think it's an interesting curiosity that it exists. It's too bad that we didn't start this podcast uh, some years ago and get this information then because Scott and I actually have run into Harlan Ellison at Star Trek cons. We would have been able to ask him this and now he's passed away and we will never have that opportunity. That is too bad. Yeah. But we will always have that time at Starbucks with him. That's right. That's right. (laughs) So that wraps up my behind the scenes on In Like Flint. So Scott, back to you. Okay, well, um, I guess that leads us into to what we think now in, in 2021. So, Matthew, you're our guest. You've revisited the film. What do you think of it now? 
I mean, I think it suffers in the way that a lot of sequels suffer, where it basically doubles down on everything that was popular in the first movie and gives you too much of it. You know, like we get early on another Flint apartment scene with, with Cramden Flint's boss going to try to recruit him again. And this is where we have the dolphin talking, you know, it's like he, he, again, he's really good at everything, but they just turn it up to 11 on, on everything. And it's not always for the better. Um, you get, uh, you know, yeah, he he talks to dolphins. I do. I did like the gag where he mentions a book on a subject he's been working on and how it's already abs- obsolete. And Cramden's surprised. How do you have time to read? And he's like, "Read? No, I wrote that." <laughs> that was great. I love that line. Mm. Yeah, there's there's definitely. I mean, there's a lot to still enjoy in this, but I do think they just kind of turn everything up too much. Um, I also think it just doesn't hold together as well overall, like the pacing. And I don't know if this was Gordon Douglas's fault or if it was the fault of his illness, but the pacing really isn't there. I know in the first one, you guys had talked about it dragging in the middle a bit, which I agree with, but overall, I think that's a pretty fast paced movie. Whereas this one, even though there's some great action sequences, it really feels like it's, it's eons between them. Um, It feels like much longer than a two hour movie. Um, and it, it it suffers severely for not having a female lead. It really makes you miss Gila Golan because, um, yeah, there just isn't one. You know, there's a scene with with the, his Russian uh, uh, love interest, or you know, not love interest, but uh, contact hookup. Yeah, <laughs> and there's he now has you know three new live-in girlfriends um which i think is a shame like you guys pointed out some really interesting things that i'd never thought of about the first movie in terms of how actually like respectful his relationship with his polyamorous uh uh living girlfriends was in that movie which is interesting because he just sort of i thought more of like the hugh hefner lifestyle but you're right you know they took the time to show him actually interacting with each one on a very personal level you don't get that in this movie more to the point, this idea that they're replaceable takes away any of that kind of personal relationship aspect to it. Um, and it is more like this Hugh Hefner thing of he just mm-hmm. lives with a harem of women all the time. Yeah, it's a real shame that they just dismiss that good uh, good work in the first film very quickly just by saying, oh, five was too much. Yeah, and they have like this, per- one of the women has this perky line where she's like, no, we're new, all of us. And it's like, oh, <laughs> like it, it's not great. Not great. No, I will definitely agree about the, the the pacing before I get to my thoughts in general. But this film makes our man Flint feel like a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I watch these things twice. So, yeah, I am. Um, I lost five of what? Four hours of my life, I think. Mm, yeah. Um, but Cam, what, what did you think? So I found this film frustrating uh i was actually really on board with it early on it was definitely amping up the crazy Mm. um the dolphin stuff as has been mentioned was very strange but there's a kookiness to the 60s spy atmosphere they're building the world building they're doing in the first section where i was like okay like it doesn't have the um sort of coherent spy plot of the first one like i think the first one actually does put together a pretty decent spy film um, you know, even going off of the comedy aspects of that movie, whereas this one was much more comedy, but I thought, okay, I'm kind of enjoying how crazy it is when you have, you know, these like young boys kidnapping the president and revealing themselves to be like beautiful women, you know, things like that. I was like, well, that's pretty funny, actually. There's some really funny ideas. They set up Cramden, and I was so conflicted on Cramden. We'll talk about him going forward, but at first I was like, I like seeing Lee J. Cobb with more to do. And then later I was like, I don't know that I like seeing Lee J. Cobb with this much to do. (laughs) (laughs) But early on, I'm on board. And then we kind of got to that second half, and I just felt like my enthusiasm started to deflate. And I was watching a plot just kind of roll out slowly. And I started making notes just like, I feel like I've seen this in the previous movie. A lot of it felt derivative of what I'd seen in the movie that would have been released just a year before. And when you look at the beginnings of the Bond franchise, you know, Dr. No feels very different from from Russia with Love. Whereas I began to go like, boy, our man Flint feels a lot like in like Flint, only in like Flint is just kind of copycatting it and then blowing it up even more so. And it's not as much fun. So 
I don't know. I was a real mixed bag on this one in that I could enjoy a lot of the craziness of it. But I found in terms of a story that kind of kept me compelled throughout, it really sagged. And I just want to apologize to that middle section of the original film that I said was a little dragged out because this movie <laughs> really, really uh, pushed that to the limit. <laughs> yeah, I... I uh... I agree. Um, I do want to, though, give you guys a little bit of pushback on a previous thing, because it's interesting that you say that this is you liked it less because it was doing the same thing, because with Billion Dollar Brain, the third Harry Palmer and one of my favorite movies, you criticized it for being so different from the Ipcris file. And I was thinking, listening to you guys and Shane Whaley talking about that, that, oh, what would you make of Goldfinger? You know, because it's it's not exactly like dr no you know um so i'm I'm teasing of course but uh <laughs> it is interesting that uh you know this is the opposite of what happened with that series tried to do something new with that sequel which you're not the only ones who don't like a lot of people don't like that movie uh i personally like that they tried to reinvent the series each time um I prefer that to this where basically they're trying to exactly duplicate what came before and honestly if from russia with love and goldfinger had been exactly dr no the bond series wouldn't be what it is today you know i mean we we talk about the bond formula which there definitely is but the three movies those first three movies are decidedly independent of each other you know each one has a very different thing whereas in like flint is almost a cookie cutter uh of our man flint i will stand up for us a little bit <laughs> firstly and and you know I'm not a fan of the Ipcris file. Yeah, I'm on record. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm on I'm on a list on the uh, Spyberry website somewhere, I think. But um, I don't think the Harry Palmer character works outside of the, uh, the gritty realism scope, which Ipcris file and Funeral in Berlin kind of you know work within. Billion Dollar Brain, I think, just pushes it a little too far into the Bond exaggerated style of of spy films. Which is which is where I had the problem with it. Yeah, I, I, I see. I see where you're coming from on it. I just um I've never found it as Bondy as a lot of people because while well, yes, it may have the Bondian scope, it certainly doesn't have the Bondian tone, you know, with this idea it's, the tone is more Doctor Strange love and and this um idea that really the anti communists are the bad ones, you know, which you wouldn't find in a Bond movie. So I thought it was interesting to see that formula sort of flipped in a more Harry Palmer direction. So to me, I saw them as taking that Bond formula and making it suit the character rather than trying to make the character suit the the different formula. But I, I understand where you're coming from. But talking about Flint, I understand Cam's point, and I agree. Um, the first sort of 30 minutes, again, are, are, are my favorite of this film. I, I wouldn't say it copies our man flint but it is definitely derivative of i agree there i mean we still have a triumvirate of villains you know and we still have mm. and then things like what i mentioned in the apartment scene they also play up jokes that were good enough just to be verbal in the first one like oh i'm going to moscow for the ballet uh, you're going all the way there to see it no i'm performing this one we have to actually see him performing in the ballet which is a ridiculous visual gag much more naked gun level than anything in the first movie you know or casino royale 67 level of spoof which is kind of different from the level of spoof we got in uh in our man flint the film even bends over backwards to to set that joke up. Like you have Lee J. Cobb's character reaching at a really awkward <laughs> angle just to get the shot to pivot onto James Coburn's hand. I was like, why have you done that all that work for a really bad joke? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even just like villain plot stuff where it's like, again, the girlfriends are kidnapped. There's brainwashing right. going on. Um, it just felt like, boy, we're really kind of, we're trading in you know, a weather machine for nuclear bombs. It, it all felt very samey to me. And they do kind of subvert um, that when we get to the ending. And, you know, obviously the um, the male villains take over. But it just felt like I was kind of watching the same movie just blown up to bigger proportions and without the kind of inspired creativity of the first one. Yeah. And again, there's, you know, an island at the end, which obviously is a spy trope in general. But again, I'd point out that in those first three Bond movies, only one of them had a villain with an island. Um, yeah, that's true. Well, I guess I'll um, I'll talk about what I think on, on, on the film, just uh, initially, at least anyway. Again, I agree the 30 minutes 
that section works for me. I think it's got that charm that the first film had. But one thing I think this film suffers from is a lack of James Coburn. Like he's not in the first 15 minutes of the film. Yeah. He then disappears after the sort of 30 minute mark for some more Lee J. Cobb. And I think this film is great when he's on screen doing action set pieces or, or you know talking with people. That's fun. But you have all these other scenes of just these pointless characters. Lee J. Cobb's fine, but like, I don't, I don't want he, he Lee J. Cobb feels like the lead of this film. Often he does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, cause I think, you know, there are things that I like about the film and I'm sure we'll talk about that more, but the foremost among them remains James Coburn. He is wonderful in the role, you know, even, if, even if he's not the most invested in it, he's still, he pulls it off. Absolutely. And his physicality again is, is great. And, and we get a scene that really showcases that in that fight in a gymnasium where he gets to show off all of the martial arts moves that Bruce Lee has been teaching him. But um, he, yeah, you're right. He's off screen for far too much of the movie, including that lengthy part of the beginning where you're just waiting. Where is Flint? I think it would work better if we knew the Lee J Cobb character better. Um, he's in the first one for sure, but he's also, you know, he's kind of got the Emerald and it would be like if in from Russia with love, we spent like half an hour with M um, you know, <laughs> carrying the plot along and it's nothing against Bernard Lee, but that would feel a little strange. And I enjoyed parts of it. Like Lee J. Cobb is kind of camping it up a bit. I like the bit where he has the double cigarettes in his mouth and he's being <laughs> seduced by Gene Hale as the villainess at the time. Um, Lisa, um, I was very unaware of who, the, of what this character's name was throughout the course of the movie. Cause she kept changing her name. But, um, I enjoyed that aspect of it and just some of the craziness with the kidnapping of the president. There's a lot here that I can enjoy and it, even if it was throwing me off with the lack of James Coburn, I was at least involved in the world building of it because it seemed consistently inspired. Like they were coming up with a very crazy setup for their movie. So I don't, I don't know whether I would say I was necessarily enthralled with it all. I think the, the lack of, Coburn at times meant the world felt that I, well, I didn't really care as much. Like I, I, I was happy to see Lee J. Cobb, you know, Cramden was one of my favorite bits about our man Flint, but seeing him in more of a leading role just made me sort of freeze up with the film. I didn't really invest as much. Yeah. And I mean, we're, we're skirting around it because it comes in more in the, in the second half, but a huge part of the problem that I have with this f- film is I just, you know, I, I spend a lot of time defending James Bond and a lot of 60s spies from charges of misogyny. This one cannot be defended from that. It's, it, is, it is just a frankly misogynist movie. And part of that is channeled through the Cramden character, which is ugly. You know, like you get um, early on when he's when he's set up uh, after Gene Hale seduces him and then she puts on makeup to look uglier uh, before the uh, people come in and take photographs to... Um, to besmirch his, his reputation. And he talks about, well, uh, yeah, you should have seen her without her makeup. And Flint, I think says that uh, must've been traumatic. You know, it's just f- from right there, we have this just very kind of unpleasant way of talking about women and uh, particularly women's beauty that was not present in the first movie. The first movie, you are not a pleasure unit. You know, it was a surprisingly, um, forward thinking uh, in its sexual politics whereas this movie is even even if they thought that they were being revolutionary in some way they are as backwards thinking you know as as they can really get well you cited up front that a lot of this felt like it was inspired by you know the playboy era with hugh hefner and this feels like kind of i don't think it's intentional but it's kind of veering into the darker side of that of that sort of movement in the sixties, like the first one, as you know, you just mentioned as well, like it felt like it was trying to be somewhat progressive in its own sixties way. Whereas here there's a lot of kind of just boy, the way it deals with its women characters isn't very good. The idea that they're going to take over the world. I actually really thought that was fun. And then they completely pull the rug out from under all the women characters. And you're like, Oh, not great. And like, I had a quote from James Coburn here that was just, 
kind of icky too, where he mentions um, most of the young women in the sequel were girlfriends of the execs working at the studio. It was playtime for those guys. And you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a short that they that they filmed on the set, which is is on the Blu-ray, and and it was there was even an article in Variety about this short being filmed about the women. But the way that it goes about it, it it it's one of those like it's a ten minute long short, which is way too long for this. But it's it's about hey girls. It's it's narrated by I assume she was probably a comedian at the time or something. But it, it's it's about weight loss and like girls. Are you trying to lose weight? You know, and and shows a lot of middle aged women and is just talking about it, it depicts them in in a again in a misogynist way. It, very much in terms of the, uh, in keeping with the beauty culture of the Mad Men era. But it's like um yeah that's short it, it just typifies what you just said about that that idea of oh it's their wives and girlfriends uh or not wives it's their girlfriends and mistresses you know um it it's just sort of unpleasant it leaves a bad taste and uh re- especially today but I, I imagine even at the time it must have like you said it's the flip side of the playboy lifestyle the first one managed to find that fun spot in the 60s sexual revolution of enjoyment for men and women like yes it's a it's a uh you know flint is the one with with three girlfriends but they're all into it you know they're all part of it and and it's interesting that they're able to pull that off and make it seem like like something that the women are active participants in and getting deriving pleasure from and certainly at the end where he's deprogramming women who have been brainwashed to be pleasure units by telling them they are not a pleasure unit. You know, it's really giving agency to all these kind of like random 60s spy girls that you get in all the movies, you know, the Bond girl formula or the the Matt Helm called them the sleigh girls. Uh, Flint tried to like make the fabulous Flint girls stick, but uh, I don't think anyone ever really talks about the fabulous Flint girls. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's icky in this one. Um, the, the first one it may have been just some remarkable kind of alchemy that they were able to make it work in a way that isn't. It's probably nine times out of 10, you would come up with this, this icky version of it, but it's really, even in a genre that was largely, you know, uh, certainly not the most uh, forward thinking in sexual politics. This is a particularly uh, backwards thinking one. It's, It's even strange when you think that it had the same writer. Yeah, the first one, and and in such a close proximity to each other in that year gap, uh, I don't know why his his uh, his agenda had changed so uh, radically in that time. I don't really understand. And even the the conceit at the beginning of the film, where you know Cramden's character is caught sleeping with with Lisa, and you know he's caught in bed with this lady in prosthetics to make her look quote unquote uglier. Now it's never established he's married, so he's not. He's not sleeping around, so he's just sleeping with someone. Why is that going to ruin his career? I don't really understand that sleeping with an ugly person is going to ruin this guy's career. Right. I don't. I don't get that. Um, is that a little bit of because he's sort of older generation? Is that like some conservative morality thing? Like the fact that he's having this like drunken one night stand with a woman, and he's like occupying a very prestigious role in the government. Like I, I don't know. I'm baffled by this. Yeah, I think some of it is just that kind of sex scandal thing of, you know, in the 60s, you were having political sex scandals being reported on for the first time, but not to any degree like they are today. But in England, you had, uh, what was it, the Profumo? Am I pronouncing that right? Um, The Christine Keeler scandal early in the 60s. And I think it was supposed to be something like that. But you're right. If he were established as married, it would be a lot more um obvious why it was bad but i think it was just like if you're in government and you're caught having sex that's bad at that time well with an ugly person right sorry that i should yeah <laughs> apparently yeah, yeah. That's, that that that's that's the difference maker you know if she was good looking it would all be fine right no one had any problems with rumors of kennedy and marilyn monroe which were certainly you know out there if not they weren't reported in the press but everyone was whispering about it and it probably made people like him more you know but um yeah Cramden being caught with an ugly woman in bed. Ooh, that'll end his career. And even the the main villains, although it turns out to be a, well, one of the main villains is a male, but the other three 
women who you don't learn as much about as you do the three scientists, I think, in Our Man Flint. But, you know, when they explain their plan to Derek Flint later on, his initial reaction is just to laugh in their face. Yes. Now, that is where we're not actually seeing what was originally intended. That is part of the Fox, uh, what Fox wanted. Uh, but it is, you know, that's the film we have to judge. And I mean, we should say, I don't think we've actually said that we've hinted at, but the plot of the movie is this triumvirate of women who want to take over the world for, and have women rule it. You know, they're going to replace world leaders and women will make all the decisions. And, that's what Flint laughs at in the in the version of the movie that we see. However, that that conversation was cut um, at uh, Fox exec Richard Zanuck's uh, insistence. So what Saul David had wanted, and presumably Finberg and and Coburn, um, this is actually uh, something that um, a friend of mine, Colin Stutz, brought up in a documentary on on the Blu-ray. But the longer version of that speech was Flint says to them, I'm sure all of your facts are accurate, but like every underdog in this world, you know a great deal more about the sickness than you do the cure. When you propose what you propose here merely turns the coin over. It's the same old coin. It's a slug on one side, girls, and it's a slug on the other. Now forget it. So that's not exactly Flint's feminist manifesto there, but it's better than what we get in the movie, which is just now forget it. It's like just him laughing at them and the idea of women in power. Uh, whereas, you know, at least it was going to be originally, it sounds like Flint agrees with them. It's just, he doesn't agree with their way of going about it, which is absolutely in keeping with his character in the first movie where he does seem to agree with the three scientists, you know, with their ideals for the world, just not with doing it through brainwashing. And I like the idea of him saying we need to be on equal footing for this to work versus one side dominating the other. Um, that would at least give the movie a little more substance. And the fact that they just have the guys take it over and you get like a cute nod at the end of like, hey, women actually do. Because they all kind of like wink at the camera. But it's like, <laughs> oh, that's just bad. Like that is just like so pandering. It doesn't feel like it's actually contributing anything of value to the movie. It's just like a well, come on, it's all okay though, right? It couldn't possibly be more pandering. <laughs> like the, yeah. the president says, well, ladies, it was touch and go, but I hope you learned your lesson. The world is better off in our hands. I mean, you could not be more condescending than that. And yes, you get this look between the ladies, like they understand that, but I don't get the feeling that the film's on their side. No, yeah, and um, Operation Smooch is not the most progressive concept <laughs> I've seen in spy movies. <laughs> Especially going from you are not a pleasure unit when you're earlier to Operation Smooch. You know, it is, uh, yeah. And, and the fact that even we do have women with agency in this movie, you know, they're certainly empowered, these these women who are planning to take over the world, but at the turn of a hat, they're undone by this general that they've allied themselves with. And actually, that's a very 2021 idea, the idea of the male ally who is not actually feminist, but that wasn't what they were going for here. You know, this was just the the men are, are better at even um, world world taking over than the women, you know, so it's very easy for them to take their plans and turn them into their own plans. And it just feels you, you've you just established some very capable female villains, even if it's dubious the way that they're being used in the movie. And then you pull the rug out from under them and they have zero threat whatsoever. And the only way that they can actually take action is with Operation Smooch, where they go into automatic seductress mode. It's like saying this is the only way that women can ha have agency in this world. And there's also a very another really poor image that goes with that whole plan where you have all these women at this point, they're all in bikinis, basically all in these boats uh -huh. launching into the water. But it's Flint standing at the bow of the ship, <laughs> like in command of this whole operation. And it's like, oh, yeah. So they don't even ha get the full credit for agency behind this plan. Yeah, not great. Not great. And I think what would have helped it a lot more and helped this movie, perhaps when it came to this sort of plot element is the Lisa character, who I thought was just so watery. Like, Gene Hale is fine, but this character just kind of waffles a lot, and we see, you know, she's kind of giving in to these uh, sort of romantic tensions with Flint. 
I think it needed to be just a stronger willed character and someone with more charisma because I just never felt like I had a good grasp on who this villain even was. Yeah, um, I mean, she's certainly not the character that uh, Gila Golan is in the first movie, where, yes, she she does that standard spy movie thing of being seduced by the hero and changing sides, but you feel that you understand why. Uh, you know, and if we'd had that with, with Jean Hale, she would feel like more of a lead. But as it is, again, also combined with the fact that she just doesn't have much time on screen with James Coburn, she doesn't feel like a lead. It feels like we don't have a lead. We have a succession of women guest stars throughout the movie, but no female lead. I'm I'm curious before we move on to some other bits of the film. You you mentioned there was a lot of turmoil with the ending. Was that just to do with the changing of the the speech, or was there more to it there? Uh, well, yeah, the changing of the speech was a big part. Uh, Zanuck just didn't didn't want to get into politics of equality i mean i'm not sure what your stance against the those politics are in fa- i mean i could see if it was against the whole idea of of this oh we're gonna our villains are gonna be feminists but it wasn't no it was that well okay then they should you know be talked down to <laughs> let's not have them let's not have a good dialogue with them uh no it more had to do with the final line of the movie which was um where after Flint is coming back from space, where he eventually goes to save the world, he was going to say, uh, Cramden was going to ask him over the comms, so what have you learned, Derek? And he was going to say, I've learned that men and women are not brothers, which I'm not sure that that's as great a line as Saul David thought it was. (laughs) Saul David thought it was a nobody's perfect, like an amazing ending capper to a movie. And Zanuck just didn't get it at all. And they bashed heads constantly to a way that I, so David had just signed a new contract with Fox before this, because not only was our man Flint a huge hit, so was fantastic voyage. And he was now going to earn 20% uh, of, of the profits. Once the film had made, I think 2.5 times its budget, which was a good producer deal. And he threw it all away to go to battle over this, this ending over cutting that, that speech and cutting that final line. He just loves, and I can see Coburn pulling that off. You know, I wish the deleted scene existed because uh, uh, maybe it does somewhere, but it's not on the DVDs or Blu-rays. I would love to see him saying, I've learned that men and women are not brothers. Like I, I, he could make it funny and, but, but still, I'm not sure that it's um, as quite as uh, deep as Saul David seemed to think it was because really he, he incinerated his Fox contract over that. He was thrown off the lot. <laughs> Did he was Flint meant to have said that whilst making out with the cosmonauts in zero G? I'm not sure. I wonder. Um, I mean, that's how it ends right now. I don't know if it was supposed to be while that was going on or if it was instead of that. I'm not sure. Yeah, because the way they set up that ending felt even strange to me because you expect, I don't know, an ending that maybe ties to some of the characters introduced in this movie, like Lisa (laughs) or something. And the fact it was just these two random cosmonauts on a space station, I'm like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> I don't even know who these people are. There's a lot of like setup and poor payoff in this movie. And I felt yeah. like that was an example of it. I thought the dolphin stuff as well. They're <laughs> setting up all this dolphin stuff. I'm like, okay, this is going to pay off like gangbusters. Am I going to see like an invasion of humanity by dolphins like in that Simpsons Halloween episode <laughs> or something? But it's really just him... Uh, I don't know, riding on the back of a dolphin at one point, And I'm like, that's it? <laughs> that's all you could give us? But going on for a really long time. I mean, it's probably only a minute or two, but it feels like five to ten minutes. Uh, and I agree, just the worst payoff. And in fact, I, I, I was hoping they'd just forget about the dolphin speech. It felt like it was setting something up, but certainly the first time I thought, I was like, okay, hopefully that's over with. And no, no, it comes back and poorly. I thought... And I feel like ripped off a little bit that we didn't get a scene of like James Coburn surfing on a dolphin through the water. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a more a better payoff. I think that would have uh, been more in keeping with the first film too. Yeah, although we we should say while we're talking about him making out in space, it is worth mentioning that he beats Bond by over a decade to having zero G sex. Mm, true, true. I also thought the scene where the women 
start overtaking the men physically, like in, in actual fist fights, reminded me a lot of the uh, ending of Octopussy, where Octopussy's circus start taking down all the armed guards. So, yeah, another kind of Bond illusion there. Yeah, especially since they're in bikinis, like the uh, Octopussy Circus, uh, mm, yeah. some of them. But um, I don't know. I do think Octopussy pulls that one off a little better because it didn't. It didn't feel like the women were were empowered in that scene. In in, in like Flint, it felt like that was just a kind of limp extension of the seduction element of Operation Smooch. Oh, for sure. I kind of want to pivot onto just some of our funny moments from the film some things we'd like to highlight and then maybe we'll talk about a couple of the individual performances um but there's so many strange choices in this film and to to be fair our man flint has plenty of of strange choices but they do feel in keeping within the universe and you know we've spoken about the dolphin at the start i mean even before that when the president is replaced you get this hilarious scene and i i actually watched this with my other half hannah uh, the first time round. And she hadn't experienced the first film, but she has seen the Austin Powers films. So to see the president be swapped with a mannequin oh, yeah. <laughs> and the mannequin get wheeled off, she was like, her eyes were wide at the screen. <laughs> this is how outrageous this was. Whoa, 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 Scott, you're saying this made her widen her eyes, not the opening of the film with the massage section? <laughs> oh, no, that's what our house is always like, Cam. That's <laughs> oh, okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. I thought that was bizarre, <laughs> but anyways, continue. <laughs> Oh, and actually as well if you're going back to that didn't the second austin powers film start with like a leisure resort thing hmm boy i don't i can't remember well it's they were in a hotel it started at a hotel yeah, okay. where he was on his honeymoon um it was nothing like the opening of this i remember the pool scene at the end yeah Okay, right. I just remember that sort of that vibe, and then I know Austin Powers goes to the pool scene where he does the musical number. Right. But uh, somehow, I okay, I, I thought they were connected. I will say that in the beauty, uh, in the beauty spa thing, there is something I love here of their bizarre ideas, which is hair dryers and brainwashers. <laughs> uh, or Coburn says hair washing and brainwashing at the same time. You know, this idea of those nineteen sixties hair dryers where they cover cover a woman's head entirely of doing brainwashing that that's funny i like that idea yeah that was fun there's a couple moments too of just like people almost like define gravity that actually got big laughs out of me one we referenced it earlier but the moscow ballet where suddenly like flint flies up into the sky on a wire like I legit thought that was very funny. Is it too cartoonish maybe for this franchise going off the first one? Probably, but it definitely got a kind of like Looney Tunes laugh out of me. Also, smaller moment, um, when the, I think it's the president is on the phone and he lets go of the phone and it like flies back at the receiver with like a vroom <laughs> yes. sound. I burst <laughs> out laughing. I was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> The first like, 30 minutes of this film are weird. So were you laughing at the gag or were you laughing at the existence of the gag? Ah, uh, boy, that's a good question. <laughs> Probably both at the same time, but also okay. wondering if it was supposed to be as funny as I found it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was supposed to be funny, um, but it's it's not in keeping with the rest of the movie very very much. Which made me wonder if it was just like a little thing they threw in there. It's like, oh, he's got a special phone. But to me, it was just like a comedic highlight of the entire film. <laughs> well, I'll ask a question about this, uh, the, the security guards they have throughout the film, the troopers. And why is everyone using sticks and not guns? That's a oh, good question. Yeah. Um, I can't figure it out because they have these stupid like double-sided batons. They're extendable for some reason as well. And they look ridiculous. Yeah. Very phallic as well. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, there were guns in the first one. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I do, on the subject of the security guards, I do like that that's a, a theme carried over from the first movie. It's less well done here. But I think one of the great things about the first Flint movie is that even though it was made in this studio bound, very establishment way, um, that as as I think you guys talked about, Flint himself is anti-establishment. He is not James Bond. He he's he's not the one who's joking about the Beatles and earmuffs. He's the one who would definitely listen to the Beatles, and he would listen to all of the White Album. Um, you know, yeah. he's like mm -hmm. he's the guy. He he's as Coburn was. He was really into the hippie lifestyle and stuff, and 
with that, I like that the first person we see Flint punch in Our Man Flint is someone in a U.S. Marine outfit. And this is at the time of the Vietnam War. So that was a loaded image that would have carried a lot more meaning in the 60s than it does seem today. The idea that this is our buttoned up spy hero punching a, an ostensible U.S. Marine. He's actually an imposter, we learn quickly. But I like that that continues in this. We constantly see Flint fighting men in uniform, and they are vaguely American-looking uniforms. These aren't um, these aren't the galaxy jumpsuits of the end of the first movie. That secur- these security guys with batons are in what looked like U.S. Army uniforms. And there's a whole sequence where he breaks into Galaxy's conveyor belt headquarters. I'm not sure why Galaxy needs a headquarters of conveyor belts, but (laughs) they have one, and it's one of these sets that they probably spent a lot on. And he fights a lot of these guys in military uniforms. And I think that that this was a tacit alliance with the student protesters against the Vietnam War and sort of the anti- militarization uh movement of of the late 60s the counterculture whereas bond is not that you know bond is sort of reinforcing the military industrial complex yeah and you know you mentioned you know zanuck was not interested in like the feminist subplot but it feels like if you're in the 60s making movies i would think these flint movies you want to appeal to youth culture and a lot of what they're doing with the Derek flint character seems very youth friendly so i don't know why you wouldn't want to double down as well on the you know women's liberation movement of the 60s and mesh that in with all this sort of anti um you know government and the authorities and all that sort of thing you know the man as it were it just seems like that should have been a a perfect kind of encapsulation of who flint is he is the counterculture why not really trumpet that it's so strange to me um you know, you even look at that scene where he is having the romantic scene with Yvonne Craig, you know, Batgirl to, uh, you know, anyone who watched the Adam West Batman show. Um, she's the uh, ballerina, Natasha. And, like, you look at how he's dressed. Flint is wearing, I don't even know what they are, like some sort of latex pants or something. <laughs> like, I don't even know what they are. And, like, this kind of, like, I don't know, like, kind of fluffy jacket. He looks very 60s cool. Like, why not double down, not just with the, you know, the attire and the kind of the setting of that bedroom, but also all the messaging of the movie? Yeah, absolutely. Coburn seems seems hip and with it in terms of counterculture. And it is weird that they, you know, you would have imagined that a Flint sequel would, as you say, embrace the budding feminist movement. Granted, that was really something in the 70s that came as a reaction to the way that women were pushed out of the 60s uh, anti-war movement but still like that they're the underdogs there you would expect a flint movie to be on their side rather than have the hero laugh say women running the world ha you know like that that is not in keeping with the character as otherwise established does this feel like the same derek flint as the previous film to you mostly yes because i we do see that he he continues that kind of that anti-authority uh, vein that he had there and, you know, still, still punching the uniform, still talking back to his boss, although they're a little friendlier now, but I, I do think that this, this one area it does, it feels out of character to me. The idea that he would be on, on, on the side of the patriarchy rather than on the side of those trying to undermine it. That just doesn't seem in keeping with the Flint we're originally given. I, I agree with that, Matthew. I will also add, I think there is a departure in the character in how he performs as a spy. Um, In the first film, he never is really seen to be on the back foot. Yeah. Whereas he is constantly being captured in this film or beaten up, almost burnt to death, uh, all kinds of weird endings for him. You know, he's fighting off all the soldiers in the first film. I think he would have got away with it. But in this, this film, you know, he's, He's captured and you, you get a funny line where he's like, we should try diplomacy then. And then gets whacked in the face with a baton, which made me laugh. But uh, yeah, he, I, I feel like his uh, his skills aren't as sharp in this film. That's true. Although he does always come out of it, you know, like he's we're told he's incinerated and then he hacks the special red phone and calls on it. So, yeah, I think he's still that that super spy but you're right we see him back footed more but you know what when you just said to act with a baton sorry i'm emulating your accent there but uh <laughs> it uh 
actually gives me an answer to your earlier question about why batons instead of guns. I bet it is actually part of that student protest movement, because that's what we're seeing in the imagery on the nightly news is National Guard hitting protesting students with batons. Uh, you're not generally seeing, you know, obviously, there's the famous image of the soldiers outside the Pentagon and the hippie putting the flower in, in the gun barrel. But in general, there's less imagery of guns against student protesters, but we're seeing a lot of batons. So if you're going to have an anti-authority figure, it makes sense for him to fight against batons. Okay, I can see that. Um, the only other funny moment I, I enjoyed, uh, again, with the, the gravity defying is uh Derek Flint's perfect strike he makes later in the film. Oh, that was pretty fun. That whole action sequence that involved like a trampoline, um, you know, the bars and then bowling. That was fantastic stuff. That is absolutely the best scene in the movie, I think. It's, it's it showcases Coburn so well. He's such an agile mover. You know, that's that's a huge part of his performance, the grace that he moves with. And that scene, he gets to jump around. I mean, it's this gymnastics fight. He gets to do all sorts of things. And uh, and the whole set is designed like, you know, it must have been custom made. They must have been storyboarding and set designing at the same time because it's for, you know, he's going to do this off the parallel bars and then this off the second level balcony. And, and it's a great scene that really showcases Coburn's ability. And to me, that's probably where he's the most like the Flint of the first movie. Um and like I mentioned earlier, you know, Coburn trained with Bruce Lee. That's where he was getting his moves from. And he gets to show that off in this scene. Yeah, I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, what, do you, what did you guys think of the ending in space? Now, for me, when I realized that Flint was going to space, I'm like, okay, this is going to be amazing. And I felt very let down by the slow motion fight scene in space with a very generic villain. And... It felt like if you're going to go crazy, let's go all out. And it felt pretty slow. And as as I've said, the pace really dies in that second half of the movie. And this didn't help. Yeah, agreed. I mean, and Steve Inhat can be a great spy villain on Mission Impossible he, on the TV show. He's one of my favorite villains. He actually played at least three different villains on the show. But in this episode, The Mind of Stefan Miklos, he's the best antagonist to go up against Peter Graves they ever had. And he gets to demonstrate zero of that in in this movie as the general um but yeah you've got you've got a lackluster fight in slow motion and plus it just the movie seems to be taking so long by that point like the last from from operation smooch to the end i feel like should have been wrapped up in five minutes and it's what 25 minutes of screen time something like that yeah it's a long ride to the fireworks factory <laughs> yeah i i was i was looking at my watch by the the time he was going into space and I, I definitely agree, Cam. I was, I was like, oh, if Flint's going into space, this has to be in, insane. You know, this film is already crazy. But I, I, I agree with you, Matthew. I think you've lost so much steam by the point he's flying up into space that you just don't care as much. Absolutely. And you just wait for the clock to run out. Yeah, and it would have been, I mean, because him going to the capsule is very similar to Connery going to the capsule and you only live twice. You know, like, what are we... What are we building toward here? Connery doesn't actually make it to space. Okay, if Flint is going to, that's going to be something good. You know, it's going to be on beyond Bond, but it isn't. What we then get pales absolutely in comparison to the space sequences in You Only Live Twice, you know, just, just from an effects level um, and and from an excitement level, certainly. There is more sluggish direction I found in this one in terms of sort of action sequences. Because there's like moments I could admire. You know, there's like a rooftop chase in Russia. There's the sequence mm -hmm. we mentioned in the warehouse. There's nothing wrong with these sequences. It feels like they're just a little too slow paced in the direction and editing to really reach their full impact. And I think the, um, you know, the moon fight is like the, or not the moon fight, but the rocket fight is the ultimate example of that. Yeah, it's this deliberately slow thing that just isn't working for a finale. And you're right, like that rooftop fight, that doesn't work for me at all. And it should, you know, the idea of Derek Flint being chased across Moscow rooftops, that that should be awesome. But to me, it's let down by the studio bound nature of it, which is a problem I have with both Flint movies, I have to admit. I mean, yes, Fox did have great 
sets. You know, that's what they were known for in their like Doris Day movies and stuff and, and, and musicals of the, of the early sixties. Like if you want a great like apartment set and, and Derek Flint certainly has one, like go turn to the Fox movies, but it just wasn't working in the post bond world. Um, because the Bond movies did such a good job of combining locations and sets. And when they had sets, they were enormous. You know, like Ken Adams' volcano set, it, it, you just couldn't put that up against these Russian rooftops. Like, it's night and day. It's like I was mentioning earlier with with the idea of a Eurospy movie going up against Bond. You know, Flint is not Eurospy. This is a Hollywood studio with a lot of money behind it but it still just looks so studio bound. It's so, yes, it's a great set in terms of 1960s sets, but it is so obviously a set that it really detracts from the sequence for me. And, and across the board, I think the Flint movies are, the, I think that hinders them for me in general, the very studio bound feel that they have. There was a part where he like leaped across the rooftops there and landed on more of a narrow area. And the whole thing shook when he landed on it. And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> not great, not great. Well, this this ties back to what I said in the sort of briefing section at the beginning when you said there was more money spent on this film. And I was a bit surprised because the first film just felt bigger. I think they were just smarter with their sets because there are so many like interesting sets they've made for this. The the rooftops look great. I mean, he like he tightrope walks between two things. There's there's all these cool gadgetry bits they do, but none of them seem to work. I would also say though, when you're going to space, that's going to cost extra money. Like they probably put a fair amount of money into all their space stuff. Yeah, I'm sure they did, and it didn't. You know, the money is not on the screen. It's not the Cubby Broccoli thing. <laughs> like it doesn't pay off. But I, I do with the tightrope walking. Actually, that's one moment I do like in that yes, part because yes, <laughs> yeah, because he crosses it like Derek Flint. He doesn't tightrope walk. Mm. He actually basically skis down that tight. Or, you know, he shoots <laughs> the 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 line out of his lighter with the eighty five functions, and then he slides. You know, one foot in front of the other down the down the rope, which is hilarious. You know, and requires this balance that only Derek Flint could have. It's testament to the first film that we could recognize something like that as a Flint moment. Yeah. True. They've set this character up so well that we know that him, you know, sliding over a tightrope is just a Flint thing. Um, I, I feel like this film has less Flint moments. Yeah. And the gadgets in the first one are more fun. Like, I really enjoyed that lighter that did like 86 things or whatever the number was. Um here, you get the Return of the Watch, which I enjoyed on that plane, right before the bizarre karaoke sequence. Um, but, like, uh, other than that, they just didn't grab me as much. Like, there's this whole thing, he's working with sound waves, which pays off with him using sound waves to fly through space, which I don't think works. If the poster for Alien taught me anything, <laughs> it's that sound isn't in space. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. That is very true. Um well, I think before we wrap up, we should just take a you know a, a quick run through the main cast and just any particular notes that we had. I mean, we've spoken about James Coburn as Derek Flint already. I don't think anyone else could play that role. No, no, uh, no one else could pull off leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing that the Euro Spy movies do really demonstrate is that there are really very few Sean Connery and James Coburn's in the world because a lot of the Euro spy films, they write the characters the same as Bond and Flint. And if you have an actor who is not, who doesn't possess this otherworldly charm that, that Coburn has in spades, you, the character ends up as a bit of an asshole. Like he's the one liners that, that Coburn can pull off and that Connery can pull off in in lesser hands, uh, and as we see in Dead on Target, even in you know Ray Danton's hands, they just don't work, and you're you're left with this really repugnant kind of uh, character. You know, and there are Euro spy movies that I still love for their set pieces or this or that, but they have really loathsome heroes uh, because they just you know it takes a very special skill to to be charming while while being perfect you know because we want to hate the perfect person um and you know flint is obviously making fun of bond's level of perfection by being even more perfect 
So that's going to be even more hateable if if you've got the wrong actor. And Coburn, I think, is the only person at all who could have pulled that off. And I think when you're writing these sort of very sexual spies, um, a lot of them are going to age like moldy bread by the time, you know, you get to where we're looking at them now. And I think the, it's a testament to the writing and to James Coburn that we don't look at Derek Flint as being kind of an icky character. Right. We've spoken about Lee Jacob a little bit as uh, Cramden. Yeah. But as I mentioned earlier, I feel like he is maybe the lead character of this film, even though it's named Flint. Well, he's the plot motivator for sure. Um, I will say this, like, Lee J. Cobb's an actor I've seen in a lot of other movies and frequently, frequently in very serious roles. Um, I had a lot of fun with Lee J. Cobb, like, showing up in drag in this movie, like, going undercover into the um, Fabulous Face Salon or uh, Beauty, you know, whatever it is, Island. Um Moments like that, I'm like, wow, I never thought I would see Lee J. Cobb do something. He's very committed to, I guess, the comedy of this film, which I can appreciate. I just wish it had been a more inspired film, but it was kind of a novelty, at least for me, to see Lee J. Cobb going really goofy. Yeah, I mean, the idea of of Cramden from the first movie going in drag is inherently funny because in the first movie, Mm -hmm. he's a very dignified character who hates having to stoop to the level of using an agent who is insubordinate but in this movie like like everything else we talked about his character is exaggerated so much from the first one that we lose the inherent humor there so when he goes in drag it almost feels natural to this version of cramden and it's not as funny as it would be if it were the cramden of that first movie and it also is another one of those ugly moments of misogyny because there's a lot of jokes about what an ugly woman he makes when he's going to the, and if the jokes were about that, he really wasn't a convincing woman and they all knew that he was crammed in drag, that would be one thing. But the jokes are more ageist jokes about uh, women. You know, they're not jokes about Lee J. Cobb. But it's also like they are onto him because they immediately escort him to a prison cell. True, but still, those yeah. comments when they first yes. when he first arrives are about an older woman, not about. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about with those comments. I'm just like, why not lead that into them, knowing immediately like that would be, make it so much funnier. I agree for sure. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, to be fair, we do leave the Crandon character at the end of Our Man Flint high fiving Derek about his work on yeah. uh, Galaxy Island. So he he is a full on. Uh, yeah, Flint stand by the end of the first film. Yeah, and, and he does get a great moment in this movie, like maybe the best moment in the movie where uh, the president at the end, when Flint has succeeded, the president goes, that must be impossible. And and Cramden like jumps up in the air and goes, of course it is. That's why he's Flint. And <laughs> yeah, that's a lot like the high five moment. It's this great bit of Flint cheerleading that really just, I, I love that, you know, and, and Cobb is great at doing that. Um, and if that were... You know, if there was less of Cramden in this movie, that would be a better moment, probably. I, I will also point out, if we're talking about things that this film did first, this film also beats uh, Diamonds of Forever with having Charles Gray in drag. Mm, yeah, true. Yeah. So uh, I, I actually think this film did it better. Uh, it's more unsettling in Diamonds Are Forever. but uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's a very unsettling film, to be fair. Yeah. Um, apart from that, we have Gene Hale as Lisa, who's kind of meant to be our touchstone into the baddies. But I mean, she, for me, she was sort of a non-entity in the film. Yeah, she barely registers, and I don't blame Hale for that. I blame the script. Yeah, and we were pretty hard on the um, henchman from the first movie who had like a mace that he wore. I don't remember what the character's name was, but... Um, I want to apologize to that character because after this movie, I was like, you know, that villain wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, we really could have done with with a henchman like that in this one. Uh, the only other thing I, I stand out performance maybe is uh, Andrew Duggan as President Trent, uh, just because he is chewing the scenery whenever he's on the screen. Yeah, he's pretty funny. And originally that was supposed to be E.G. Marshall. Um, who also would have been funny in the role, but uh, uh, Duggan, I don't know him. I'm not familiar with him the way I am with Marshall's work, but he's very good. He does he does make that work. And of course, it does lead to that line you mentioned earlier, an actor as president, which, you know, 
was funny at the time for the for the double meaning of you know the, the for the meta meaning of an actor delivering the line and funny because it has that great coburn incredulity he's great at delivering these incredulous lines uh like that it makes me think of one in uh the president's analyst where he hears about canadian spies and he just goes canadian spies and every time <laughs> oh dear <laughs> <laughs> sorry every time i hear a story about espionage in canada i hear james coburn say canadian spies and honestly cam i hope the entire country of canada uh m- memorializes that delivery because i mean it should be the motto of your intelligence agency really i will take that over paul k the canadian spy name of jason Bourne. that's far more complimentary <laughs> i can't wait to get to that film now just to make jokes about canada <laughs> I, I just can't wait. Um, I, I mean, apart from that, we've got the three ladies, uh, Helena, Simone, and, and uh, Elizabeth. They're the sort of the baddies, I guess. But again, they, uh, well, I mean, they're dismissed out of hand, basically, by halfway through the film. They also kind of just operate as a single unit within the film. Yeah, and they don't even get the gag about the uh, unexpected names the way the three scientists mm. did in the first one. They're just not... They don't register as individuals. Can anyone explain something to me about these three? I think I think I know the answer, but the film never explains it. Why are they all wearing headpieces? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know if they're trying to protect themselves from enemy brainwashing or if they're just... Uh, I think it's just a style <laughs> for older women in the time. It was the style at the time, Scott. Sure, I, I'm. Yeah, I'm wearing one now. <laughs> but did you say you had an idea about it? What's your What's your idea? I I think it was basically what you said. It was so they don't get brainwashed. Although they were the ones doing the brainwashing, so I I don't know why they were protecting themselves from it. Maybe uh-huh. to keep them warm if they wind up in the cryo chamber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a, another weird choice too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and this is a movie. It fits in the pantheon of spy movies that that end in in cryo chambers um and th- there's a lot uh, but of course it's not actually the ending i think honestly the cryo chamber would have been a better setting for a finale than than space as it as it pans out but um you know the one i think of most is kiss the girls and make them die but there there's so many of these uh sort of like b-level spy movies that have these cryo chamber endings uh and then of course austin powers had uh, made made use of cryo chambers as well later on i'm going to take this into the final question in a second but i am curious both just to ask i i think we've all agreed that this film is lesser than the first one Uh, and one of the big criticisms is it's just too long i have some ideas on how i could have fixed it just in the cutting room even if you hadn't changed the film or what was filmed but what do you guys think would would you do to change this film to improve it I mean, I think a faster pace is necessary. Like, I don't understand why this movie's longer than like 95 minutes. Um, mm. it, it feels like the sort of decision you should have made. And I think we've talked about how there's a, a lot of traction you have to go through to get to, you know, Derek Flint in space. You tighten that up. Like, I just think a movie like this, a fast pace is its friend. Like, I think it can only make the movie better. Absolutely. Yeah, the pacing would be the number one thing that I would I would try to fix. Well, no, it would be the number two thing. The number one thing would be just this the rethinking the whole idea of uh making fun of the idea of of women empowerment. Um you know, that I can see how it might have been funny in an initial like pitch meeting and it's just they really should have rethought it at some point during that. But again, obviously, we have the benefit of hindsight there. It was the era. It was different. But it certainly dates the movie much more than the first one. Uh, and the pacing does, too. You know, it, it, the first one moved and this one just doesn't. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I, I Between the two of you, your ideas were both of my ideas. I would have improved the uh, villain plot and I would have... I would have just, you know, tightened the pacing. I think getting rid of the whole Russia section would have done a lot of the work. I, I mean, I, I agree with you, except I thought Yvonne Craig was a lot of fun there. So I would try I would try to keep that, I think, in some way, shape or form, but keep it briefer. It's it's quite long. It's dragged out. And, you know, you could easily tighten up the whole setup of the movie with Lee J. Cobb investigating the lost three minutes. Like, that 
takes like half an hour or something like you could easily <laughs> cut that down to a lot uh shorter yeah okay chaps has anyone got any final notes on the film before we get to the knock list well i'd just like to say because i i I've feel that i've come off very negative on it and i think we all have that there are things i really like in it uh coburn we've talked about obviously but there are some great gags you know they're unfortunately pay uh, you know space too far apart from each other but things like uh when he goes to his learjet and the mechanic who i think is a cameo from bill lear himself uh says uh he asks him empty all the ashtrays and he says no got you a new plane <laughs> like that's a <laughs> yeah that's just a fun one and then um you know uh the the book line i wrote it you know that stuff and brain and hair washing at the same time there's a lot of really funny uh lines and funny deliveries in it and i want to mention too that one one person from the first one who brings his a game once again is jerry goldsmith like the score is stellar Mm -hmm. throughout the action music during that gymnastics fight scene we were talking about it really propels the scene and in the russian rooftop I feel like the music is trying its hardest to make that exciting and the editing and the direction are just working against it. And there's only so much a composer can do in the end, but it's another great score. um, Just like the first movie. Yeah. I mean, I agree. There's a lot of good gags in the movie. It's just that it's a very slow paced movie. Uh, That's why I say like, you know, if it's 95 minutes with a lot of funny gags, even if they, don't necessarily follow what we would expect from the first one and it is more you know kind of going wackier for the sake of being wackier i think it could at least be a really funny wacky 95 minute movie versus what we have here um there was one thing i might just mention though there's a uh, opening scene at the salon someone's reading a magazine advertising fantastic voyage and that was produced by saul david the producer of this film so there's a little bit of a uh, in joke there for um you know 60s film fans yeah, and another, um, yeah, like the Call Me Buona joke in, in From Russia With Love. Uh, although another another thing that I want to say is is good about it, although it has nothing to do with actually watching the movie, though, but is the poster. Uh, I have a In Like Flint poster on my wall in my apartment. I don't have an Hour Man Flint one. That had a great poster, too, but I just feel like the In Like Flint art is is certainly equally as good maybe better than for the first one. And to me, that's important. You know, the things like the soundtrack and the poster, that's all part of what I think of, of making the 60s spy formula, of making it whole. Um, and yeah, if you l- look up that poster, and it's it's a terrific poster. I definitely agree on the, the Jerry Goldsmith thing. It, it's hard to find a bad Jerry Goldsmith score, but I would have liked to have seen just some more jokes. I think in the film too. Uh, I I liked the craziness of the first, you know, half an hour, forty five minutes with the the time loss and the uh, the talking to dolphins. I I just thought that was fun. The German Shepherd. And I think it lost a lot of its fun. Yeah, I, I, yeah. That's another thing. Dog continuity. I appreciate that. Uh-huh. Um, okay, gents. I think we have arrived at the question: Is in like Flint joining our man Flint? on the knock list matthew you're our guest take it away well i just want to congratulate you guys on making thanks to your rallying cry scott absolutely the right pick with the first flint movie i think it's you know it's historical significance as one of the main bond rivals or or imitators of the 60s absolutely earns it a place on the knock list the sequel however for all the reasons we've talked about is just a lesser beast than the original and no i would not vote this on the knock list what about you cam yeah it's a no for me as well i just wonder if they even understood what a Derek flint series was because you know bond had the benefit of a lot of ian fleming novels to adapt but i just feel like with this one they didn't really have the imagination to think beyond what they'd already done before and so they kind of just said okay let's try to replicate that and in this case, go goofier with it. And the results just weren't as much fun. It's trying to be more fun than the first, but I think it's actually less. And so it's it was a frustrating experience. It's not a movie I hate by any stretch of the imagination, but I was kind of bummed out when I finished it, just thinking like, oh, I'd really enjoyed rewatching Our Man Flint. I was hoping this would be another one that I would look forward to rewatching in the future. And I just didn't feel that when it was over. Um, I, I'll, I'll make it easy. It's a no from me. I feel like uh, I agree with you, Cam. I don't think they know what made a Flint film. 
successful and, and, and why people enjoyed the first one. So they just replicated it in their own way. I was weirdly uh, reminded of Star Trek Into Darkness. Oh. Of all films. Um, okay. Just because of a few things. First of all, you know, they recycle a lot of the tropes from the first film in the second film and to, you know, lesser results. They also amplify a lot of the stuff in the first film and it also has a wet fart of a villain. Yeah, yeah, that's true enough. Yeah. Um, and so, and that film was a disappointment as well. So, but still a financial success. Crazy that. But I mean, I usually when I say no to the knock list, uh, but we're not slamming the film, I will say, oh, still go check it out. I'm not going to say necessarily check this one out unless you're a completionist. I think Al Manflint stands out as a, a perfect example of these spy spoofs of the 60s. And that's why I voted for it for the knock list and rallied for it, uh, you know, mere months ago. But this one for me, I think it's just too long. It's just too long and not as funny. Yeah, I would never recommend it to someone uh, new to the genre, for example, except there is a perverse side of me that likes recommending things for the very things that put me off. So I mentioned initially being put off by Flint talking to dolphins as a kid. And if I was ever going to recommend it, it would be for there's a spy movie where the hero talks to dolphins, guys. You know, like, so just just to to tell people this exists that would be the only reason that I would probably recommend anyone watch this as opposed to the excellent first Flint movie. Why did Austin Powers not recycle that gag? It is surprising. Maybe because uh, Ace Ventura beat him to it. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah, very true. Very true. Well, there you go, folks. That is three no's. And as such, In Like Flint is not making the knock list. Now, before we talk about what we're doing next week, we have some quick words from the movie chef podcast cam roll a clip do you love movies then you love the movie chef podcast whoa, whoa what was that that's my professional podcasting voice for the trailer well you sound very stupid okay well we need to tell people that we're two movie fans who cook up movie themed podcasts and and, and special episodes on Sundays. Yeah, as well as movie menus of all our favourite topics. And diving into internet rabbit holes. Yeah, as well as movie news and trailer reactions every Thursday. And our sexual awakenings about Patrick Swayze. And our sexual awakenings... Oh, wait, what? Listen, j- just tell them who we are, what we do, and where you can find us. The Movie Chef Podcast, where we make a meal out of movies... Find us on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, and more. Better? No. There you go, guys. That was the Movie Chef podcast serving up a hot slice of movie fun every week on all major podcast apps. Matthew, thank you for taking the time to join us to talk about a film you don't necessarily like as much as some other films, but have a very interesting history with. Thank you for having me. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk about spy movies, good or bad. And I certainly enjoyed uh, discussing this one with you guys. Um, where can the listeners you know, hear more, read more from you? Uh, my blog, 00section.com. Um, that's spelled out, uh, double the letter O. And uh, on there, you can, as I said, I haven't been updating that much now, but there's a vast archive, um, you know, 16 years worth of material of reviews of all sorts of deep cut spy movies. Um, and then you can also find me in the spyberry forum on Facebook where I'm a pretty frequent um, participant and on various episodes of the spyberry podcast and the T- spy TV rewind podcast as part of that network. And we'll leave links to that in the show notes, of course. Thank you. Well, again, Matthew, thank you. Cam, what are we doing next week? Well, we're hitting the road, Scott, to hang out with Robert De Niro in 1998, Ronin. This is a film that you were very excited about choosing. This is this is a definite Cam pick, and I've never seen it, but you assured me this was a big film in the 90s. I think it's pretty well known with spy fans from the 90s. Yeah, I think it's a pretty notable film for that era. Uh, well, I mean, Robert De Niro, I'm excited. It should be fun. John Frankenheimer directed it. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. 
Perfect. Well, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out Ronin and join us next week. Now, unfortunately, In Like Flint did not make the knock list, but if you want to read more about the knock list, you can find that on letterbox.com slash spyhards. You can, of course, follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners... Blah, 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 blah